What a weekend in college football, especially in the SEC, A&M and Auburn, Ole Miss, Alabama, LSU, Arkansas. Let's all talk about it on Up to the Second College Football Season 3, Episode 4, presented by our friends at Academy Sports and Outdoors. Academy Sports and Outdoors is your college football tailgate destination and official sports good and outdoor retailer of the SEC. Stop by your local Academy store or academy.com and gear up for the game day today at Academy Sports. All right, guys, on the show today, ESPN's Marty Smith. He's got a brand new book, Sideline CEO. He loves talking SEC football. We'll chit-chat with Marty. And, of course, Billy and Caroline go around the SEC. It'll be great. But we begin with the great Marty Smith. Need a new grill? Academy Sports and Outdoors is the destination for your outdoor cooking needs. With our free in-store assembly and pre-assembled grills and smokers, buy online at academy.com and pick up in-store. So keep those grilling plants at Academy Sports and Outdoors. All right, our next guest is a great reporter and even better dude. He's an accomplished author as well with his latest book, The Sideline CEO. Here's ESPN's Marty Smith. What's up, man? I can hear the applause. It is raucous, David. How you doing, dude? Good, man. I always love talking to you. I, I think I want to start there. I want to get to your book, but I want to start things off with life in the SEC right now. And why do you think there's been such a dip to the beginning of the season for SEC teams? I just don't know, but it is odd. Um, you know, the statistics are telling that uh, it's been a long time since we've had so few 3-0 and teams uh, after three weekends. But when you look at Alabama being down and trying to figure out what they are offensively, uh, that's certainly one of the biggest stories in the conference. Tennessee still trying to figure it out a bit offensively. They got exposed some uh, at the Swamp last weekend. Uh, your guy, Connor Wegman, looks – uh, very, very good. I mean, he's got a 92-8 QBR, which is the best in the conference. So it would appear on paper that the Jimbo Fisher-Bobby Petrino marriage is is uh, unfolding well. Um, Hugh Freeze is undefeated. I mean, the guy wins. It's what he does. But it's just been a, it's been a very odd start to this SEC slate. Uh, Georgia, of course, is still number one in the country, deservedly so. They're still sort of working it out with Carson Beck at quarterback. But I'm just sort of interested with the SEC's positioning in the broader scope of the sport right now as opposed to normal. And that's one thing we're going to break down in a big way on Saturday on SEC Nation down there in College Station. Marty, let's kind of go back to A&M for a moment. Uh, They failed their test against Miami, at least defensively. Um, how do you caddy this team considering some of the issues defensively, but the offense is working? And as you mentioned, Connor, if you got a good quarterback, you can win a lot of games. Score the football. <laughs> um, they do have a ton of weapons offensively. I mean, you watch them on tape, it's like they got dudes. And he has been so efficient and and just really making good decisions. And if, again, we've said it, from the jump, if Jimbo continues to kind of let Petrino run this thing the way that he sees fit, I think they have a great opportunity because Jimbo does need to be a CEO. I mean, he there's so much to manage when you're the head coach that getting in the day-to-day nuance of game planning can be a distraction from all those macro things you have to think about. And so hopefully for, for the Aggies that continues, but yeah, man. Uh, I felt like that was a really impressive performance by Miami, though, too. Uh, just for the record, they played very well. Mario has done a great job down there. Uh, people are lauding him in every single facet of of that job. And so A&M has a great opportunity, David. I, obviously, y'all have the talent, and I think Jimbo's a great coach. I think that uh, obviously the resources are there, and – Who knows what it's going to end up being when we get to December in the SEC West. I think LSU is really good, super good. So A&M has a shot. Marty, my thing is with Bama, I keep expecting for Nick to figure this out. And look, they only got one loss. They didn't look good against South Florida. I think they're going to figure it out, but is it going to be too little too late potentially? Not yet. Uh, They haven't played an SEC West game yet, so – They'll have one this weekend against Ole Miss, and you know Lane's licking his chops at the opportunity to join that list of former assistants that beats the GOAT. 
Uh, I do believe that Jalen Milrow gives them the best opportunity to win behind center. Where they have not done a great job is running an offensive scheme and philosophy that is best befitting his skill set. They got to run the football, man, and they got to do it well and then take some shots off that with play action. Thing is, the offensive line's not great right now either. And so it's a series of issues. It's not just quarterback. People want to point to quarterback, but offensive line play has not been spectacular either. And Tommy Reese, the offensive coordinator, look, it's hard to come into a Nick Saban regime and just stake your claim. Just stake it. Now, Lane did it. Sark already had a bit of a pedigree coming in. And, you know, Tommy did a good job at Notre Dame, but he's still sort of trying to find his way, I think. And that can't be easy. So, it, I think it is a work in progress, but I mean, look, I think Jalen Milrow is going to be the best athlete on every single field he steps on. And so use it. Marty, I want to ask you about one other SEC team. Look, this is just life in the SEC. We know that, but Arkansas loses to BYU. They've got LSU coming up. They got AM after that. This is a huge stretch for them. Oh, it is. No question. You know, I, I like, I like the guys they have and I love coach Pittman, but and it's going to be very difficult. Um, LSU, again, I, I couldn't have been more impressed. I was in Starkville last weekend. Those fans were lathered up. I had talked to Will Rogers, the quarterback, and he said to me, look, we're never going to be one of those teams that shows up unprepared. We want everybody to know that we're in a fist fight every single time. And then LSU comes in and really imposed its will. Jaden Daniels had one of the best games in the history of the conference. I mean, for the quarter, for at the quarterback position, he was just awesome. And so, I really like LSU. They got beat for one quarter against Florida State. Um, otherwise, they've been they've been pretty good, and I expect that to continue this weekend as they continue to build self confidence. I like KJ Jefferson. I think that they have a lot of talent in certain places, but that league is merciless, David. The SEC West is merciless. So yeah, it ain't gonna get any easier for Arkansas. Marty, let's talk a little bit about your book, Sideline CEO, and just how it all came together and, and some of the you, – you took the best minds in sports, not just college football, the best minds in sports and how they put their teams together. Take me a little bit through that. Well, thank you for giving me the platform to discuss it, first of all. But, yeah, I interviewed Coach Saban, Dabo Sweeney, Jimbo, Mac Brown, Roy Williams, John Calipari, Tom Izzo, Doc Rivers, Patty Gasso, Kim Mulkey, on and on. It really is kind of a who's who of great champion leaders. And I broke the book into eight pillars. What exactly is leadership, trust, communication and listening, delegation, culture, uh, crisis management, self-evaluation, evolution. All of those are vital to great leadership. And then I dove into all of those different principles and some other things with each of these individuals that are in the book. And I think ultimately what came out of it was a very digestible way to inject these principles into your daily walk. Now, I know this, coaches, especially at the you know youth, high school, smaller college levels, are going to love this. And business leaders who are trying to develop a culture are going to love this. There's so much that you can use from these great leadership minds. And so I, I, I would love if y'all checked it out. I expect it to impact your lives if you do. And again, I made it super digestible by writing it in a, an oral history type of format where you can put it down and pick it right back up and not have to go back and find out where you just were. It's really easily digestible. Marty, one of the quotes that struck me from the book, um, and I think is you know, very apparent here at Texas A&M, was from Coach Cal on creating a winning culture. The whole idea in our program is culture is about achievement. The culture here is about being competitive. The culture here is about learning the battle and fight like hell for your opportunity. There were some culture issues here for several reasons at A&M. They think they've cleaned it up. But any successful organization has to have that kind of mindset. And everybody eats. You know, that was, the, that was the part of that amazing John Calipari quote 
to me, everybody eats. And the reason that's important today in collegiate athletics is, especially at a place like Texas A&M on the football side and certainly Kentucky on the basketball side, creme de la creme. You're getting, you, you have an opportunity to get the best players in the country every single year. So what does that mean? That means the young people coming in there have been told since they were teenage, young teenagers, you're the greatest player that's ever come out of this place. You're the greatest thing since peanut butter. You're God's gift to football or basketball. And so they get there, and then all of a sudden they look around and go, oh, hell, these guys are just as good as I am or better. So what's that mean? That means that you have to have the self-awareness as an individual to demand of self to find best self and not sulk so that you inject and integrate yourself into that culture. And these guys have to do it in such a high-pressure, winner-get-out-of-here culture, uh, uh, like expectation level. And so it's just it, it really is very interesting from from that perspective. Marty, great stuff, man. I really appreciate your time. You know how much I enjoy talking to you, and I'll, I'll see you in College Station soon. I look forward to it, brother. We'll see you all down there this weekend. Have a good one. At Academy Sports and Outdoors, bikes for the whole family are just a click away. Buy online at academy.com with our free in-store assembly. Your next set of wheels plus helmets, pads, and water bottles will be waiting for you at our in-store pickup counter. Get to the fun faster with our in-store pickup and free assembly at Academy Sports and Outdoors. All right, our thanks to Marty Smith and ESPN. That sideline CEO book is going to be really, really good. All right, coming up next, Billy Lucci, Caroline Fenton. They're talking about all the big storylines in the SEC. Welcome into Up to the Second, presented by Academy. I'm Caroline Fenton. He is Billy Lucci. We break down all the action of the week before in SEC football and, of course, preview the action in the week looking ahead. Texas A&M took care of business this past week against ULM. I don't care who you're playing. Anytime you can hold any team to three points, that's a win. That's a good day, especially without the defense looked against Miami. How are we feeling about Texas A&M? I think, you know, it's it was kind of like when LSU went and played, was it Grambling after losing to Florida State? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of like that, right? You just want to see. Right. It's a get right Saturday. And uh, they got right. I thought Connor Wigman looked spectacular. Uh, you had a couple injuries at receiver, Noah Thomas, Evan Stewart. And you, oh, hey, by the way, remember, we still got this Anaya Smith guy, and he's seven for 127. Jade, Don't forget about him. Yeah, and a new, a new face, Jade Walker, the, the transfer from Grand Valley State, had 100-plus yards by halftime. Like you said, you can nitpick the defense. and We weren't going to learn anything. Just like LSU Grambling, you don't learn anything. Um, but I like the way they came out and they, they handled business early. I believe LSU let Grambling score 10 or 14 points early in that one, didn't they? It was like I saw they the score. Let, it was They let Grambling score on, the first, on their first two possessions. Yeah. They got into field goal range on the third and just missed the field goal. I mean, they gave up 100 rushing yards yeah. in the first half wow. to Grambling. I didn't made know some defensive like adjustments, didn't allow a point since then. But I mean, I think those games are so important going mm. into conference play, especially when you have those tough games early in the schedule, like A and M had with Miami, yeah. like LSU had with Florida State. Of look, you know, maybe some things went wrong. There's a lot of ta tape that you can go back and watch, adjustments that you probably needed to make but didn't make in that time. Get a get right game, confidence booster game, having it at home with the place is rocking. Um, it just gets a little added juice going into conference play when things, you know, get harder inevitably when you're going through the gauntlet of an SEC West schedule. Yeah, it does. And and they, they like I said, they needed it, but not a whole lot to talk about there. I think yeah. we're going to revisit Wigman here a little bit later. Yeah. And we're certainly going to talk about A&M Auburn. And in fact... Maybe we dive into that now because with LSU, yeah. we've got two to talk about. We're going to talk about what just happened with the, the Tigers and Mississippi State, talk about a get right Saturday, and we're going to Seriously. talk about uh, LSU Arkansas, which is another big one for, for your group. So 
I guess let's let's talk about this Auburn game. I'm fascinated by it, Caroline. I don't know how familiar you are with the series. The Aggies are one in five, one in four. Hopefully not one in five. They're one in four in five games at home against Auburn in the SEC. And I think they're four and two on the road at Auburn. So the series has been really weird. And really, last year's game was so crazy that the Aggies, there's no way you look back and go, how could they have lost that game? Or it would be, you know, one and four each. It would be one and four, one and five. So right. the home team has not had a lot of success. I think the Aggies won their last one, 20 to three. Or they, that was the first time they beat Auburn at home. So a really interesting Weird. game. And damn, if this isn't an important one for, for Jimbo and the Aggies. Uh, you're playing at home. It's Hugh Freeze's first year, fourth game. They're undefeated, but they haven't done anything to impress. They're banged up up front. They're banged up in the secondary. I just feel like this is one that AM has to get no matter how it goes. And Hugh Freeze, as, as you know, as an LSU fan and someone that's covered this conference and, and lives up there in Tennessee, mm-hmm. that dude's not who you want to see on that other sideline when you've got to get a win. And it, I'm, I'm really interested in this one. I could see it. I could see it being a, a, a scary four quarter football game, or I could see A and M kind of playing the way everybody expected that they would play coming into the year. Now would be a great time to see it. I was talking to Dari Noka earlier this week on Sirius XM, and he asked me, like, what team in the SEC do you feel like you don't really know enough about? Like you just haven't seen enough from. I said in the East, probably Kentucky. Yeah. In the West, it's Auburn. And yeah. I think part of that is Kentucky hasn't really played anyone, you know, great or anyone worth watching. Of course, Auburn had that game against Cal, but I don't really know how much we learned about Auburn. They brought in all of the transfers this offseason. So I think it's kind of natural to just have a few questions about who the playmakers are on this team. How is Peyton Thorne going to progress in this offense? You know, what kind of contribution can Robbie Ashford have? Because Hugh Freeze said that, like, we would like to use both quarterbacks, and we've seen it, where, you know, Peyton Thorne can kind of be your conductor of the offense. Robbie Ashford can come in on maybe those fourth and one, third and three situations, pick up a few yards with his legs. But I think that a ms really lucky playing Auburn this weekend, and it's because I don't want to be that team that plays Auburn in November. Yeah. Like, I thought that I – th- I thought from the beginning, from the jump, even be- so before we've seen Alabama's issues the last few weeks, that the Iron Bowl could get really interesting. And that, I think, is the Hugh Freeze effect, that he yeah. is such a good coach and always seems to find, you know, a way to make chicken salad out of chicken you-know-what at mm-hmm. the quarterback position. That's no disrespect to Peyton Thorne, but, you know, going into the season, I don't think anybody chicken, felt you know all that confident about Peyton Thorne or the quarterback position at Auburn. I wouldn't be surprised to, to see this offense take leaps and bounds of improvement week over week over week. I just don't think that's going to happen against A&M this weekend. I think that A&M has too big of a grasp of what it wants to be and what the identity of that team is. You know, what worries me about the matchup or, or, or a matchup where I just – this is a game where where DJ Durkin has to show, hey, we've made we've made some adjustments. Yeah, and everybody got upset last week when they saw Fidel Diggs or Overton or or Eni White drop into coverage. In other words, that defensive end dropping, and people get frustrated. And they saw some three man looks, and I'm like, look, they still they've been much more married to four down linemen on defense this year. That plays to the team's strength. I don't have a problem with DJ Durkin maybe setting some things up for this week. And I hope that's what he was doing. I assume that's what he was doing because this is this is the game because, Caroline, everything you just said about Hugh Freeze is so true. But I think the offenses just get better from here on out that, that yeah. A&M's going to face. Maybe not the, the X's and O's that Freeze can, can work, but – this is the game that, that we've got to see, like, okay, A&M has made some strides defensively. If this is a shootout and A&M wins it, you know, 34-31 against a team that scored 14 against Cal, 
this is not it's not that's not going to be a a bode well for the rest of the season thing Mm -hmm. uh this the test will be how does Durkin and this defense hold up against an Auburn team that's banged up on the O-line and is still certainly figuring things out offensively so that is my big test of uh, of the week and I want to see also how much how much more time to throw does Connor Wigman have than, than he did two weeks ago against Miami? Because they were all over him. He was the most pressured quarterback in the country that week. Auburn is good up front. I want to see if that O line has improved in terms of the protection. Because if you give Wigman time to throw, I think that's a real bad matchup for Auburn, which is that the Aggie receivers versus the Auburn DBs. Here's my one good thing and one bad thing based off of what you just said. I think the good thing is defensively. I didn't think the issue was, you know, the players. I didn't think the issue was that Miami just out-talented Texas A&M in the secondary. I thought Mm -hmm. that it was just not a good game plan from DJ Durkin. Mm -hmm. But that's okay because you can fix that. As long as you lose those early games – they're not season killers, but if you don't learn from those mistakes and if you don't make those adjustments moving forward throughout the rest of the season, then yeah, like, then it can be a season killer if it's an issue that persists. So I thought it was more of a scheme thing rather than a talent thing. That's good. That can be fixed. Yeah. My worry on the offensive line is, is this just our, what they are? Like are, are, mm-hmm. uh, what we've seen where Connor Wigman is kind of on the move a lot, kind of running for his life. Is that what we're going to see from this offensive line? And it's not what I expected. Like I expected this offensive line to take some steps forward, just given that you now there were you know young guys that now have a year of experience under their belts. But the other good thing of that is Connor Wigman can make those off platform throws. Like you don't yeah. always want him to do that. You don't want him running for his life. But I think that he is a quarterback that's shown that he can make a play out of something that maybe other quarterbacks in this league, it would be a sack or a loss or, you know, a turnover on downs, whatever it might be. Connor Wigman can make things happen with his legs and extend those plays. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, Speaking of extending plays, there's Jaden Daniels. Yeah. Uh, Let's transition to this LSU team. Really tough season opening loss. Learned nothing about him against Grambling, although you, you mentioned last week the running back Transfer from Notre Dame, who who looked look he exactly like you said, very explosive. But I, first of all, I want to ask you about the, the the freshman running back that just about how m- crazy was that? I mean, that was absurd. <laughs> What's his <laughs> and, and his name is what he the, Caleb Jackson. The, yeah, Caleb Jackson. What he did to that Mississippi State defensive back. I mean, <laughs> we haven't seen that since we saw Leonard Fournette running over maroon and white defenders here at Kyle Field several years ago, but that was ridiculous. Um, what was ridiculous was how bad LSU made Will Rogers and Mississippi State look. Maybe more so, even more ridiculous, is how bad the Mississippi State coaching staff is making Will Rogers look. I mean, this is Caroline, is this not the biggest square peg route, round hole thing you've seen this year? Because I... I went from kind of liking like their chances with Will Arnett mm-hmm. uh, to watching it now, and I'm just going, I, I don't see it, man. They look like the 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 team that is the first. They won nine games last year, and they don't look anything like that. And and credit LSU, but also red flag Mississippi State for the way it, the shocking thing was how LSU just cut through them like butter when LSU had the ball. That's what's that's Arnett's calling card, defense, and they returned a lot of guys. So credit Daniels and 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 those receiver. I mean, what a what a showing to have. What do you have? They have almost two hundred yards receiving at halftime. Am I wrong? Yeah. And Malik Neighbors, uh, and that may have been just Malik Neighbors alone. No, yeah, I think Malik Neighbors had one eighty yeah. something at halftime. I mean, that credit LSU, but also like I said, uh, Mississippi State's looking. Pretty rough right now in the early season. Barely beat Arizona, and now this. I think Zach Arnett is teaching a master class in how to ruin an offense. Did I call him Will Arnett? Will Arnett from Saturday Night Live might yeah. coach offense better <laughs> right now than Zach Arnett. <laughs> That's Amy Poehler's husband. <laughs> is it really? Maybe what we saw on Saturday was more laughable <laughs> than Will Arnett, the comedian. Yeah. Because, I mean... 
Zach Garnett mm-hmm. has taken all the air out of the air raid. And look, I, I'm cool with wanting to change an offensive philosophy, trying mm-hmm. to put your own thumbprint in in an offense, but also you're trying to win games. Yeah. Like, Will Rogers has been in the air raid for the past, what, three years? Three, mm-hmm. four years? And it has worked. Yeah. And I think one thing, one reason why Mike Leach worked at Mississippi State, and I say worked, and that's, you know, Mississippi State standards. I don't think Mississippi State standards are going 12-0 and and going to Atlanta every single year, but winning eight, nine, ten games, those are good years at yeah. Mississippi State. So I think he was successful because... I think the air raid can be successful without five-star talent at every single position. You know, Alabama's always been successful because they just have some of the best players in the country. The air raid, you can take a good quarterback and good receivers and put up a lot of points and a lot of yards doing it. I don't think that what Zach Arnett is doing is complementary to the clear you know, divide in talent that Mississippi State is going to have on their schedule. You know, when Mississippi yeah. State plays Texas A&M, Texas A&M is going to have more talent. LSU, LSU had more talent. Alabama, Alabama will have more talent. Ole Miss, Ole Miss probably has more talent. But the air raid at least was able to just, like, squeeze all of the juice out of the lemon. Yeah. I mean, I get wanting to run the ball more, but that, if there was a certain a stat going into half that at that point LSU was averaging 8.7 yards of play. Mississippi State was averaging 0. .7. Oh, man. Yeah. 0. It, it, it just seven looked... yards of play. They couldn't get anything done. And Zach Arnett's supposed to be the best defensive mind in the SEC. Yeah. And they didn't get any pressure. I that's where I would be try. most That's where I would be most concerned. Um, LSU looked – they looked Saturday like the best team in the SEC. And I know we're sitting here riding these waves. You and I come in here and we're like, totally. well, you know, but – they looked like the best team in the SEC uh, that Saturday. I'm keeping it in Athens, Georgia, until proven otherwise. But man, Georgia looks more vulnerable than they have in a few, you know, three, four years or so. Alabama, Caroline, Bam, now they're back. Cool. They're back to Jalen Milrow. We'll talk about Bama here in a second. LSU, Arkansas this weekend. That has always been like a, a very competitive, seems like it, maybe I'm wrong, but a, a, a rivalry game. Last year, KJ Jefferson, uh, they, um, they almost beat LSU, but KJ Jefferson got hurt in that one, did he not? Yeah, he didn't play. They in brought that in the game. guy. Yeah, they, they had the guy from, uh, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name. He's committed to AM forever from transfer from North Carolina. Cade something. Yes. So mean of me to not remember. But he they lost sixteen I think they lost sixteen thirteen. Was that Hornsby and then and then Cade Fort Hornsby Cade Fortin. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And 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 then he just lit up LSU's defense. So a rivalry game. Arkansas lost a a bad home loss to a BYU team that barely beat Sam Houston a couple weeks ago. And they give up thirty eight. Uh I don't think that bodes well for the Razorbacks when, when you're playing Daniels and, and and neighbors coming off of the game they just had. Tell me why this game is, is going to be competitive and why LSU is not going to be kind of cruised to 2-0 and at home against the Hogs and watch the Hogs fall to 0-2 in league play. Yeah. I know oh, I'm this sorry, 0-1. Is... Oh, they, they played BYU last week. Yeah, it, it was – the craziest thing to me is last weekend against BYU, Arkansas, excuse me, BYU put up like 280, give or take a couple yards here and there, 280 yards of offense, and they put up over 30 points. Yeah. And I don't, like, I can't make that make sense in my head, mm-hmm. and it's because Arkansas gave them short fields. They had two punts, one of 10 yards and one of 28. Yeah. Like, you just, you can't do that. I don't care if you're playing BYU, LSU. I don't care if you're playing Nowhere's Phil State Community College, you're gonna you're gonna lose yeah. games when you do that. So I think that LSU will win this game. One, because this is just a game that LSU wins. Like there are a few games on LSU schedule that those are just games that you need to win in order mm-hmm. to keep your postseason hopes alive, you know, in order to stay competitive in the SEC West. You know, in the last ten years, LSU has taken seven of the last ten. Um, yeah. And of course, one in 2021, when LSU was just absolutely horrendous, they uh, they dropped that game. 
Um, I think it comes down to a few things. One, Arkansas's offensive line is atrocious. Yeah. It's bad. They just cannot And they were so good last year. KJ. They were so good last and year up front. You've got an offensive line head coach. I don't get how the offensive line can look so bad. So I look at a defensive line for LSU that I think has looked good all three weeks, but really had a statement performance last week at Mississippi mm-hmm. State. And now they're kind of finding themselves. Now that Harold Perkins is in his rightful place and doing yeah. whatever it is the heck that he wants to do. Um, I think this defensive line is going to feast on the offensive line, but there is one area, you know, Arkansas has solid, a solid secondary. Like mm-hmm. Arkansas does not have a bad defense. I'm going to be interested to see that matchup between, you know, a Malik neighbors, a Brian Thomas and that Arkansas secondary. Yeah. I, I like LSU big in this one. Like I haven't even looked at that line yet. I think it's like minus eight and a half. I'm oh man, I'm all over that. I could be. I'm wrong a lot, but yeah, I I think LSU wins that one by definitely more than two scores. You know, ten points or more. And and if they run them out of there, it wouldn't. It wouldn't shock me. I I think. I think that's how that one's going to go. We we didn't get a prediction from you. How do you think A and M Auburn is going to turn out? I think that this is going to be a similar day that LSU had against Mississippi State. Oh, wow. And it's funny because we've compared the way that these two teams have kind of come along over the first three weeks. Mm-hmm. But I think that this is going to be an opportunity for Texas A&M, one of the few opportunities where you get a team that's still trying to figure itself out, yeah. where you get a team that's still kind of settling into a new system with a new quarterback. I think Texas A&M can and should take advantage of that. So I would take Texas a and I think this is going to be a fairly high scoring game. Um, I would say I would take Texas a and 35, 21. You know, I had I, just a few minutes ago, we were recording something else. I had a and 34, 24. So we're kind of in the same ballpark. Um, you're right. They're getting Auburn at, a, at, at early in this, the figuring it out process. They're probably going to get Arkansas after back to back losses. Um, and they're going to get Dallas Al- in Dallas. They're going to get Alabama at home with an Alabama team. That's just trying to figure things out, especially at quarterback. So, I mean, and, and, and now you look at Tennessee and you're going hmm. quick, quick thought, Caroline, yeah. because I want to preview a couple of games before we go. Tennessee volunteers. What's wrong with them? I mean, they got, that was a, that was a, they got smacked around by, that was unexpected. I know some people were picking Florida just and it was almost only because of history there. But there were some red flags against Austin P. They got smacked around in the swamp. And Milton's I not said, Milton's not blowing people away right now. No, he hasn't. And I said, look, I don't buy into things like, you know, a team can't beat a certain coach no. or a team can't win in a certain stadium. I don't buy into that. I thought Tennessee hasn't beaten Florida in the swamp in the last 20 years because Tennessee has been awful the last 20 years. Maybe it's true. Like, maybe there is some kind of weird juju in the swamp that Tennessee just loses all inhibitions and loses all sense of what is right and what (laughs) is wrong on a football field. But I think overall the biggest problem is that this team just isn't last year's team. Yeah. That, that, you know, that Joe Milton just isn't Hendon Hooker. You lose your starting quarterback. Your two starting receivers, James your starting Hyatt left tackle. I mean, I think that maybe we didn't, maybe we didn't talk enough about that going into this season. That we all just counted on Josh Heupel. We all thought Joe Milton's a veteran. We all counted on that Joe Milton performance against Clemson because maybe we didn't really realize how bad Clemson truly was. Yeah, I didn't think we talked enough about how much turnover that Tennessee team had. Mm-hmm. And now I saw a Tennessee team that I thought the defense was getting better, couldn't get any pressure on Graham Mertz, couldn't make a tackle. Mm. Joe Milton, all he could do is throw slants and run the football. I think the problem right now is they're just in transition. Yeah. That last year wasn't lightning in a bottle, that they will be back there once these young players and yeah. Nico gets into the mix. Nico Avalayava, their five-star quarterback, that they're yeah. paying just millions and millions of dollars. Once they get this next core kind of in the fold. I think Tennessee's going to be a good team. This yeah. is just not that year. Yeah, and I think they're going to – and, hell, who knows, maybe A&M will be playing the true freshman by then. Depends on how things go for Tennessee over the next few weeks. But 
let's preview a couple of big ones. We talked, yeah. all, we've already talked two of them. A&M, Auburn, and Arkansas, LSU would both certainly be on that list this weekend. Uh, the, the big one, I guess, it's kind of the only, it's the third and I think only other one of real significant interest this weekend, right? Or am I missing something? I'm thinking of Ole Miss, Alabama. Is there? Is there? Oh another, yeah. Is there another SEC oh. game that's a real interest generator? I mean, those are the only ones involving ranked teams. Mississippi State, South Carolina. I guess if you want to see somebody's you know, in trouble, back somebody's in trouble both after of those that. Teams. One. Yeah, yeah. South both Carolina, those teams need a win. That's a good point, Caroline. Because if 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 Shane Beamer and South Carolina drop that one, their schedules, like I don't think that game saves Mississippi State. But if South Carolina drops that one, and they've got three losses already, and looking ahead to the rest of the SEC schedule and Clemson, like that, they could be in for a rough, a rough road to hoe there uh, in Columbia. So yeah, that's that's a good one. But let's talk the big one. Yeah, uh, the big one in the SEC this week is obviously Alabama, Ole Miss. Man, I want to look at this and go, they're counting out Nick Saban. They're counting him out, and and that is a dangerous game to play. But I'm watching football this year, and I watch a lot of that South Florida game, and I watch them play against Texas. And I watched them struggle a lot last year in a lot of football games, including one against a 5-7 and seven A&M team. Um, Bama, I think Bama's in trouble this weekend. Unless they can just line up and say, we're going to run Jalen Milrow and we're going to run these running backs, and we think your run defense, Pete Golding, sucks, <laughs> and we think we can run all over you. I think if they don't run for 280-plus yards – they're going to lose that football game. I, I, I'm, I think Jackson Dart and and that Ole Miss running game and the SEC's leading rusher from 2022 are going to be a big problem for Alabama on Saturday. And Lane Kiffin might join a group that used to include nobody, and now it includes Jimbo Fisher, Kirby Smart. Steve Sarkeesian, and I think soon to be Lane Kiffin. And I don't even know that Ole Miss is that good. That's what's scary. I feel, I feel like we do this with Ole Miss every year. We do. Like Ole Miss plays, you know, some not very good teams at the beginning of their schedule. Maybe they eke out a good win against a, a solid team early in the year. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking, okay, Ole Miss, this could be the year. This could be the year. And then Ole Miss gets exposed for whatever reason. For last year, I think they got exposed for their defense. So their mm -hmm. defense just couldn't stop a damn thing. Mm -hmm. Or last year, Jackson Dart was pretty inconsistent. This year, you know, Jackson Dart looks much improved. Like, Jackson Dart has proven to us. And I know it was against Tulane against their second-string quarterback in Georgia yeah. Tech. But Jackson Dart really carried that team. And the fact that, that Ole Miss is now 3-0 and going into SEC play and have gotten, what, 130 yards from – Quinchon Judkins yeah, through three games. Crazy. It's fairly impressive. The defense mm -hmm. looks improved. But again, I, like, I always do this. Whenever there's an SEC team that hasn't played a high level of competition, we always overestimate them. I was guilty of doing that mm -hmm. with Tennessee. I thought, well, they beat Austin P in Virginia. And it seemed very clear after that loss to Florida. Well, yeah, they beat Austin P in Virginia. You know, <laughs> yeah, what is teaching right? us about any of these teams? So this is obviously going to be the biggest test on Ole Miss's schedule so yeah. far. And I, I this just... won't be the biggest test on Alabama's schedule so far. And I think that might be a key here. That Alabama's battle tested. Like they've been exposed. Yeah. They've seen some of their weaknesses. That's true. And Ole Miss, again, like you said, they didn't have Pratt playing at Tulane. That is a and and, and Ole Miss had to survive that game. Yeah, you're playing. It's kind of like away it's kind of like Texas played Wyoming this weekend. People Look forget back. they were playing Wyoming's backup quarterback. Okay, that wasn't the guy that beat Tech, and that was ten to ten in the fourth quarter until Xavier Worthy worked his magic and Texas pulled away. That game was ten ten a minute in the fourth quarter, and and Quinn Ewers needed a little swing pass that went for forty five yards, or he's finishing that game with under a hundred yards passing, fifty percent. Texas is interesting because I think they're going to ride 
Wigman's in. Incons- I mean, uh, Wigman has not been in because Ewers inconsistency uh, all year. So did did I say Connor Wigman threw that pass to him, or did I say Ewers? Ewers wouldn't have topped. I think you said Connor Wigman. Yeah, I think I but that's did. Okay. You got Wigman. We're about to right. talk about Wigman. Yeah, because we're about <laughs> to talk about our players of the year. And I'm spoiler alert: he's on my list still. Uh, but you watch that football game and. Ole Miss was in a dogfight with Tulane and their backup. Georgia Tech's really bad. So we don't know a lot, like really you bad. said. Uh, now, maybe Georgia Tech might beat South Florida, though. I don't know. That'd be a, probably a pretty good game. Plot twist. I like Ole Miss. I don't like Lane Kiffin, but I like Lane Kiffin to beat Nick Saban this Saturday. And guess what's going to happen? Everyone is going to be on the Ole Miss bandwagon. And, and Alabama. 100%. And Alabama is going to have two losses before the end of September. Question for you in this Ole Miss Alabama game: Does the loser of this game still have hopes that are alive to win the SEC West? You know, my answer will be yes if that team is Ole Miss, because Ole Miss. I don't think Bama, if they if they suffer their second loss and they're zero and one, I I just think that that will tell me that they have so many more issues. They they've still got to play LSU. They've got to play A and M. We got to play at, at Kyle Field. They got to play Tennessee. There's Arkansas. You mentioned the Iron Bowl and what what Auburn can be later in the year. I just think. I think Alabama will have a tough, tough road in front of them to avoid a second. I don't think that would be their last SEC loss. So could they win it at six and two? Sure, LSU did last year. Yeah. If Bama loses this one, I think it'll be the the second worst season they've had under Saban. Because I think if they lose this one Saturday, I think there's probably a couple more out there. And I think you're looking at maybe a five and three. SEC Bama, if Ole Miss loses it, I think they can look at the rest of their schedule. And I think it's really manageable in terms of there's nobody they're going to play that they go, okay, we can't win that one. And I think they don't get Georgia, right? Am I right about that? I don't think Ole, Ole Miss. Miss. Yeah. Ole Miss does not get Georgia. Yeah, so they don't I mean, get, they always have Vandy, and I don't know who else they have. They don't get Georgia, Georgia, and they get A&M at home. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think Ole Miss can look at it and kind of say, I- "I'm I'm exaggerating right now because we don't know enough about A and M." But just if you really want to break it down simple, you can go, "Hey, if we if we can, if we can beat A and M and LSU, we could win this thing." They do get Georgia. Oh, they do. I just looked up their schedule. They do get Georgia. Okay, so late with that there. said, let's change this up. My answer to your question is no. I don't think if it, I think the loser of this game, even though they would just have their first SEC loss, I, I just I don't think they navigated enough. They'll each, for in my opinion, for sure lose another one, and probably each lose two more of of their final seven. I think it's an elimination game for it's not elimination, but I mean I, I just think the loser of this one you can kind of push aside until further notice. I just can't, in my heart of hearts, pick Lane Kiffin to beat Nick Saban and Brian Denny. I know, and I that I know that sounds like a cop out, and I I have seen I how how rough Alabama has looked, especially by Alabama standards. And you could say, well, you know, you picked Sark to go into Brian Denny and beat Nick Saban, so what's the difference? I think the difference is Jackson Dart's not Quinn Ewers. Jackson Dart is a heck of a quarterback, but he's not Quinn Ewers. Ole Miss doesn't have an Xavier Worthy. Now, I don't know if Quinn Shen Judkins is going to be healthy. Yeah. And if he is healthy, how much can he really give And their you? O-line is I mean, suspect, and Texas's was not. That is it's not. And Ole Miss has a, a solid defense, not as good as Texas's. And not so tested. So I just, it's, it's no. It, they're on, in zero position and in zero part of the field is Ole Miss as good as Texas. Mm. And I know, like, Texas won by double digits. But mm-hmm. Alabama was leading Texas going into the fourth quarter. True. Like, that was – it was a blow. It, like, they got beat, and they got their butts handed to them. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't like Alabama wasn't in that game. 
Yeah. I, I know they have their issues. I know. I, like, I know. I just cannot. I cannot trust Lane Kiffin enough to go into this game and win it. But I think yeah. it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be a close back and forth game. Like, I wouldn't be surprised to see Ole Miss lead at the half. Yeah. And then Alabama just run up the scoreboard in the second half. My thing is that Bama run game. Let's see it. And that Ole Miss O line. Yeah. Can they hold up? Mm-hmm. You know, that. So going in, let's close it out because we talked about Ole Miss just now. Who are your top three? Who are our top three candidates for uh, player of the year in this league through three weeks now? Um, go ahead. You, first. you mentioned You mentioned one, and mm-hmm. we're in lockstep here, and it's Connor Wigman. Mm-hmm. I just am so impressed every single week by what Connor Wigman does. I mean, he just goes in. He takes care of business, and he looks like so much more of a veteran quarterback than he is. Yeah. So he's my top one. Okay, he's your number one. He's my number one. Okay, my my top three will go like this. Right now, I've got Jaden Daniels at three. I think his performance, Connor was 25 of 29 against New Mexico, I mean, uh, against ULM. Jaden had similar numbers against an SEC opponent and and really was on fire. I was really impressed with how he threw the football. And look, his one setback came at the hands of a, of a top five Florida State team where he made a lot of yeah. plays in that game for a while, too. Uh, he was kind of, to me, he was the reason LSU was in it for as long as they were. So I, I'll put Jaden totally at three, agree. plus that pedigree and that body of work. At number two, I've got Connor right now. Um, again, he's got to start to, to, to be that SEC player of the year. I think you've got to be on a team where you, you've stacked some wins. He's got to get like, he's got to get Auburn. He's got to get Arkansas. And then you get that one like he got last year against LSU. There's got to be that high profile uh, victory there. But, uh, and then, like I said, he was, he was good against Miami. He was the best thing AM had going against Miami, but they lost that one. So right now, I'm going to go with the guy that's undefeated at one and, and making a ton of plays. And I think he's quietly carrying his football team right now and it's Jackson Dart yeah at Ole Miss and this could be a, a flip-flop Saturday if Connor goes out there torches Auburn or Jaden Daniels goes out there you know you Jackson Dart will get his chance to prove that hey I belong to stay up there I, I think all three of those guys are getting interesting tests this weekend who are your yeah, final Jack- two Jackson Dart's my two mm-hmm. and the only reason I gave Wakeman the nod was because of quality of competition yeah that even though Texas A&M lost that game to Miami Connor Wakeman still went out there against a good defense yeah. and looked really good so I yeah, had I Jackson Dart two and then I split three if that's allowed yeah and if it's, it's not always, it's always allowed if it's not who cares Caroline this is um, your show <laughs> so it's allowed yeah I've got Malik Neighbors and Luther Burden. I, was, I wanted to put Malik Neighbors, but Luther Burden was a good pick. Luther he was sensational, Burden. the five-star. He has been sneaky productive. And I say sneaky because I just don't know how many people actually watch Missouri games. I but finally Luther did. Burden, it's a great game. That dude's great explosive. Game. He has over 100 receiving yards in two out of the three games. In that third game, he had 96. Mm -hmm. 114 receiving yards and two touchdowns against Kansas State. And it's like every time, like I think if I'm Brady Cook, it's let me lob it up because Luther's down there somewhere. Every time the ball's in his hands, he makes a play. And I I think that if he played for an Alabama or an A&M or an LSU, we'd be talking about him a whole lot more. But Luther Burden has been, I think he is... He's carrying that Missouri offense. Neighbors, Evan Stewart, Luther Burden. Yes. There's a ton of real talent in the, in, in the SEC at receiver this year. The, those three might end up being the three best. Uh, could have a nice battle on our hands for uh, first team all SEC offense if they're only going to put two guys on there. Evan, quiet this week. He didn't suit up, didn't play. He should be back this weekend against Auburn. So should Noah Thomas. Uh, the Aggies are going to need that. Let's close it out with this. You tweeted, I don't know where you was, Twitter, Instagram. What are you? What did you do last night uh, in your spare time, Caroline? <laughs> so I have been. Uh, I've taken up jujitsu. There is a uh, a local jujitsu gym in Nashville, 
and they were looking to like expand their female audience. Mm -hmm. I was looking to just try something new. So I had my first jujitsu class last How'd night and I got my butt whooped. <laughs> you got throttled. I, I walk in and I walk in and I look so out of place because I'm wearing like Lululemon yeah, and I yeah. have my purse with my boxing gloves coming out. Like I look completely out of place walking into a gym with like these 250 pound just massive men who do this on the weekends like in competitions. I step in and I'm like, what in the world did I get myself into? But I had a blast. Good. Had a great time. Are you sore today? I'm so sore I couldn't get out of bed. Really? <laughs> Interesting. Well, you I'm know, because so I've been sore. on Nuno. This is why I bring this up, because <laughs> you know, David, I've been on him about, I joke with him, I say he's 50. It's like I get mad when people say I'm 50 and I'm closer to it than he is. But I'm like, you're 50. It's a mindset. You're just rolling, you know, rolling down to Brian and just rolling around on the mats with guys just just letting them just sling you around like they're trained you're not like you're gonna get hurt and i'm giving him a hard time about it but he loves it and he's so into it um and i, I guarantee it's gonna get him in great shape too but what we want to see i just want you when you come here for the next game just to roll up and put him in some kind of chokehold and drop him i'm gonna start telling him i'm gonna start telling him hey i'm you know what we're gonna do because He's going to interview Marty Smith here on this segment. We're going to lie. I'm going to tell him, did you know Caroline's been taking jiu-jitsu like her whole life? Oh, I'm a black belt. Yeah, so we're going to start. I'm going to start. I don't want you to do it because you might get in trouble at your new dojo. That you can't lie about that kind. I don't know much, Fenton, but I don't think you can go around telling people you're a black belt when you're not. Well, I don't know. But much I can either. do it. But I can tell people you are. So because you don't subscribe to the rules of the dojo? I don't, because no <laughs> dojo is getting their hands on me. I'm staying away from those. But what we're going to do is we're going to convince Nuno that you are. And so when, when he's on one of these interviews with us, we'll trick him into start asking you questions and stuff. So I don't think he's going to watch this. Should and I no, surprise and him? Should I put him? the luchador mask on and just come up out of nowhere yeah. and just body slam him? Yeah, like just take like an arm, you know, do one of those like arm bars or something. Although, like, he's prancing around here like he could take out anybody. After, we'll see, because like, I've been to one jujitsu class, so we will put that to the test. Well, we're gonna lie to him that when in, when if you're watching this, guys, don't tell Nuno about this. Let us have our fun. I should have planned this better off air, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get him anyway. All we'll right, Caroline. Him. Hopefully, I can't wait to kick his ass. I know, right? Hopefully, we're talking about a couple of ass kickings this weekend that go our way one in baton rouge one in college station but either way we'll have a lot to talk about who does lsu have after this one who they have next after week after arkansas that's a good question um and then it's Ole miss on the road at Ole miss wow. at two road games back to back at Ole miss and then at wow. missouri so Ole miss goes bama and, and lsu to open sec play uh, all right, well, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be talking about LSU Ole Miss. We'll be talking about A&M Arkansas, and we'll be reviewing a whole hell of a lot of action. Fun Saturday in college football. I'll say it right now. The game I'm most excited to see, I want to see Sam Hartman in Notre Dame against Ohio yep. State. That one's going to be a, a lot of fun. I can't wait to see that one. I want to see Oregon, Colorado. Mm. Yeah, there's That's some good, going there's some to great be a good games. one as well. There, it's a good slate in week four. Yeah, so is. we'll have all of our thoughts. Going to break down all of the action next week. For Billy Lucci, I'm Caroline Fenton. It's Up to the Second brought to you by our friends over at Academy. All right, that does it for Up to the Second College Football. Thanks to our good friends at Academy Sports and Outdoors. We'll see you next week.